So you heard a lot before lunch regarding many of the aspects in terms of our biology of the disease, risk, and issues of the treatments, primarily around the medicines that we use as well as the, the role of stem cell transplant. Now, my colleagues and I here on the panel uh, and in the field, we recognize that we still have a ways to go. We clearly want to find cures for this disease that are safe and do not have the, the difficult burden of an individual undergoing a stem cell transplant. That's clearly our goal. But as we walk the path to trying to get that goal, we realize that people have unmet needs now. And having an opportunity and really the honor of interacting with many MPN patients over the years, it's very clear that these are a group of diseases that can give us a range of difficult symptoms. And we have an interest both in understanding those symptoms, but also what else in addition to traditional medicines might we be able to use to assist with that. So Dr. Sherber, who is my new colleague here uh, at UT Health in San Antonio, uh, and a longstanding collaborator over the past nine years, we've broken up this topic into two different ways. One, I'm gonna share with you a little bit about what we've learned about MPN and symptoms. And then second, Dr. Sherber is gonna share with you a little bit of what our group is looking to try to bring as a resource of some non-pharmacologic ways we're going to try to battle some of those symptoms in addition to some of obviously the therapies that you're already on, the hydroxyurea, the ruxolitinib, the anagrolide, what have you. Now as we think about having an MPN, you know, an MPN is it's a mixed disease. As you look around the audience, there's individuals of the range of age, range of how difficult the disease is affecting you. Some of you, it might be uh, much less problematic. Others, it's highly problematic. As we try to judge the burden of having an MPN, it involves many things that we had mentioned earlier. There's a risk of blood clots or bleeding, and clearly some of you have shared your stories having had some of those in the past. There are diseases that can lead to low blood counts. Low blood counts themselves can cause symptoms or risk of infection or risk of bleeding. There can be enlargement of the spleen. The spleen is a filter for the blood, but particularly in myelofibrosis, it sometimes can be massively enlarged. There is risk of progression. There is the impact of specific symptoms. And then, of course, none of this occurs in a vacuum. None of us are a disease, you're individuals. And as individuals, your health, both things that are good and bad, all add together to the other stresses and things of your life, and that's what you experience kind of in aggregate. So if an MPN patient has many other illnesses, the MPN might make those things worse and potentially vice versa. Now, MPNs can affect us in a variety of ways. As we've tried to quantify that, how, how does it affect people? Well, one way that it can affect people is that it can affect their employment by making them more tired, by interfering with the ability to work, by having individuals cut down on the amount of work that they're able to do. I have patients who are physicians who have MPNs and I've been fortunate enough to be involved with their care. And they share with me that, you know, before I had an MPN, I didn't think they were a big deal. But after having the MPN, I could say, you know, those symptoms were real. You know, if I needed a phlebotomy, I really couldn't concentrate well. Uh, I used to be able to see 16 patients a day. You know, after eight, I, I'm kind of shot. I really have to, I, I have to work half days. If I'm reading a journal article, you know, I find that by the end of the article, the words seem to dance around a little bit, and I'm having problems uh, concentrating. Uh, and that these are real and genuine difficulties that they face. Now, another thing we've tried to do is to try to improve communication and asking both patients and physicians as we treat an MPN, as you can see, it's clearly a complicated story. You know, in many other of the diseases that hematologists and medical oncologists treat in the United States, it can be sometimes more straightforward. There's, you know, an abnormality on a CT scan, 
If you give a medicine that's effective, it shrinks. If it progresses, it grows. Here, we're talking about tracking multiple different aspects of a disease. So we asked patients, ET and physicians, what was your primary goal? And we saw that by far, for physicians, as we've always been taught, the primary goal of treating ET is to prevent thrombotic events. And it's not to say that that is incorrect in any way. But what is interesting is that for ET patients, there was a huge discrepancy between one of their, their primary goals was to avoid progression in the disease. And for physicians, in large part because we've not felt that our therapies were effective, that was less of a priority. The same discrepancy occurs in PV and even stronger in myelofibrosis. Here in myelofibrosis, interestingly, perhaps based on some of the work our group has done, they are very cognizant of the difficult symptoms patients have. And patients agreed, I don't think anyone wants to feel any worse. But they want to avoid progression. People clearly want to live longer uh, and appropriately so. Now what about the symptoms? There are a range of symptoms that these diseases can cause, and they're not all interchangeable. Some are related to the blood counts being elevated. Some might be related to side effects of the medicines that you're on. Some of them might be related to other aspects of the disease, such as inflammation. Some may be related to enlargement of the spleen. So they're not all interchangeable. In efforts with the clinical trials, our group try to develop a set of questionnaires that people could agree, in medical term what we call are validated, to, to measure these symptoms and so that we could compare them. And most importantly, so we could see whether they were getting better or worse. So if you have X amount of itching, how bad is that itching? And if we give you a medicine or an intervention or you have UV therapy, whatever that is, is that itching better? And can we measure that in between people? So we created a series of questionnaires, including fatigue, spleen-related symptoms, constitutional symptoms, and quality of life. I created a series of questionnaires that have been used around the world, first for myelofibrosis. We then included additional questions that could be used for vascular symptoms or mood disorders, and created the broader scores, some of which were mentioned this morning. We now have used this in almost 20 different languages. I think Robin got most recently the validated Urdu version. Uh, Robin and my Urdu is not very good, so fortunately we had some individuals that were able to speak that language. And we have data in almost 6,000 MPN patients from around the world. And I'm able to compare what that symptom profile looks like for a 60-year-old female in Uruguay versus Shanghai versus Jakarta versus San Antonio. And what we've learned is that they're pretty similar. We've learned if you rank the symptoms in order of severity, it's almost identical around the world. We do see that there's a cultural influence in terms of how we mark severity, but not whether it is present. So there are some cultures that are a bit more stoic They'll say that it's there, but they may tend to use lower scores. Others may tend to use higher scores, but the ranking is almost identical. We've created these questionnaires that can be utilized to measure changes over time. What is it at one moment in time? Come back into the clinic, measure it again. What we have found is that these symptoms are very common and that they're not only common in myelofibrosis. They can be present in P. vera, and present in ET. Now our colleagues in hematology have sometimes asked, well, you know, Ruben, you talk on symptoms uh, and you say patients are fatigued. Well, I look at my P. vera patients, you know, and the patient that I saw before has advanced pancreatic cancer, you know, the patient I saw after has, you know, advanced ovarian cancer. So the P. vera patient is kind of the healthiest person that I see, you know, so so are they really more symptomatic than the general population? So our colleagues in Ireland did a study, and they looked 
at a matching group of individuals in the general public to a group by age, by sex, to individuals with MPNs, specifically here with PV and ET. And they were able to show without, without uh, hesitation that MPN patients were more symptomatic in each of these things across the board. Now, symptoms versus quality of life. This is an important part because there are times we use these terms interchangeably, but really they are not. Symptoms are individual things. Itching, bone pain, night sweats, individual constructs. Quality of life is a much larger discussion. First, there's quality of life. You might be perfectly healthy. Someone you love dies. Your quality of life at that moment is poor. It's nothing to do with your health. Health-related quality of life is what is your quality of life related to your health. That includes your symptoms, but it's not only about symptoms. It includes the medication-related toxicities. It includes complications. If you had a blood clot from your MPN 10 years ago, but you still have symptoms from it, that impacts your quality of life. There are the stressors of having an MPN, of which one of them is having a disease that most people really can't relate to you when you tell them you have it. Now, if you tell people you have an MPN, most people's reaction is either one, to think that there's nothing wrong with you, or two, think that you're gonna die tomorrow. You know, and probably neither of those things are accurate. So there's, there's a stress to that uncertainty. And there's a stress to the unknown. You know, if I'm in my late 40s and I'm told I have something that might get worse, what do I do with that? And we'll get back to that in a moment. Now, our group has been very interested in trying to, so we've learned from all these patients. What have we learned? Well, let me share just a few of these lessons that we've learned. One, with one of our other collaborators, uh, interestingly, Dr. Sherber's sister, who's also one of our investigators, she performed a very interesting analysis where we looked at patients with ET, PV, and MF to see well, how mixed are the symptoms. And we did an analysis. Here you could tell by colors, red is worse, blue is better. This is data in almost 2,000 patients shown in a, in a graphical way in terms of how the symptoms affect them by ET, PV, or myelofibrosis. And what we found is that there are different groups and clustering of symptoms. Some symptoms go together, some symptoms do not. And there are clusters within each of the diseases. So there are some individuals with ET that have more symptoms than some individuals with myelofibrosis. So it's not necessarily only predictable by the diagnosis. Now, what else have we learned? One, we learned that time is a factor. The longer one has an MPN, clearly the greater the burden of symptoms tend to arise, both from the potential of progression, but also due to perhaps the nature of the disease. Next, Another interesting question, what about the impact of gender? And again, although there are many uh, kind of Mars versus Venus sort of uh, jokes one might make, there is a clear biological difference in several key things related to the blood, hormonal levels, and other things that are distinct between men and women. Men have higher blood counts to begin with, particularly in terms of their hemoglobin because of the effect of testosterone. Women, as they develop these diseases, clearly many of them are perimenopausal or going into menopause. So there's, there's many different factors that are distinct. And we did find, and this was very solid across cultures, higher levels of fatigue, abdominal symptoms, microvascular symptoms, and higher total symptom scores. Next, we found an issue that isn't discussed very frequently, the issue of insomnia. And issues of insomnia with MPNs, I think, are clearly a problem. Now, clearly, there are many reasons for this, including the symptoms themselves. If you're having night sweats, if you're having itching, if you're very iron deficient in having restless leg, well, of course, you're having problems sleeping. You know, so there are many of these things that can be linked. 
your spleen is enlarged and it's difficult to find a comfortable spot to sleep. So again, many of these things are contributors. Next one that you rarely hear in any MPN talk other than mine is the concept of, of sexuality and intimacy and MPNs. And again, I've had patients tell me, whoa, you know, I'm having night sweats, I'm having itching, that's the last thing on my mind. <laughs> but by the same token, I've heard people, if they are better with a medicine or something else, you're like, you know what? I'm gonna need another pill from you because that first pill worked really well. So, so give me a script for some of those blue pills because uh, I'm feeling randy. So it's truly a, a, a tremendous uh, kind of aggregate in terms of quality of life because really our, our issues of intimacy, which, which extend much more than just straight sexuality, are a tremendous litmus test for really how well we are feeling. Because it's one of the first victims when we really don't feel well. But if we're really feeling well, though that aspect can return. Now, symptoms and biology. So what we've learned as well is that, the, that symptoms are not just in your head. These are a genuine biological consequence of the disease and that there could be contributors of both. We certainly have speculated, what is the impact of mood disorders? Is there uncertainty? Is there anxiety? Very influential patient advocate, Zen Senyak, who's been a great partner and collaborator, and he raised to me, he's like, Ruben, I interact with a lot of MPN patients. I think some of them are depressed, and that has not been identified. And that you can give them all the ruxolinib in the world, but if they have untreated depression, they're not going to feel better. I'm like, well, Zed, I'm like, that's a very interesting and very concerning observation, because if that's the case, you're right. We need to treat the right thing. So we did a study along with uh, that Robin was their first author, uh, along with our colleagues uh, at, at the MPN Research Foundation, with Zen, with others, and we used a series of questionnaires to try to identify this. We had data in almost 1,800 patients with MPNs around the world. Perhaps some of you contributed to these studies. And what we found was Zen was absolutely correct. There were higher rates, without question, uh, of anxiety, depression, stress, and grief amongst patients with MPNs. Now, it wasn't universal. It's not to say everyone in here is affected by this by any means. But it was common, uh, and much more common than the general public. And enough so that as I advise my colleagues, I'm like, you need to be mindful that that is the case and that, to be weary of that. Because again, if someone is having really unmet needs that might be a sign of depression, adjusting their MPN therapy is not going to solve that difficulty. Now, do MPN symptoms have a link to biology? Absolutely, they do. There have been demonstrated, and this is data that we had done in the ruxolitinib studies, where red shows an increase in, in proteins in the blood called cytokines that are associated with inflammation. And they were clearly increased. And these cytokines potentially have a range of things that they do. They might be involved with directly causing symptoms, proteins in the blood directly I increasing itching. We know that the white blood cells migrate under the skin and contribute to the difficult itching that some individuals have. It isn't in your head, it's a real thing. It's a white blood cells, they're getting irritated, they're going into the skin. There can be cytokines associated with disease advancement, even those that might be associated with worse outcomes. Indeed, they might even be associated with issues of progression. So we think about inflammation, and Robin will talk about inflammation in a moment, the bone marrow environment, if there's inflammation, might have a impact on whether a disease progresses or not. Now, what about understanding symptoms and how we treat the disease? Well, the MPNs, in many ways, have become a, a role model for other diseases in terms of how to understand the voice of the patient and factor that into considering the role of therapies. The FDA has used some of the experiences that have been done through these studies 
through some of the questionnaires that we've done, how they've been incorporated with I and many of my colleagues in terms of assessing how therapies uh, are chosen, how they're approved, and how we judge whether they're helpful. They also are key decision points in terms of our current national guidelines for treating MPNs, of which many of us contributed. So for example, and these make for a very dry reading, but these treatment guidelines that exist for every major blood cancer and regular cancer have uh, different decision points in which physicians look at in terms of determining how to treat an individual. This is an example in low-risk myelofibrosis where, again, the individual is diagnosed, we assess risk, but then we assess their symptoms, and based on the presence or absence of symptoms, we potentially consider a different approach. In low-risk myelofibrosis without any symptoms, we may well watch that individual. If an individual has symptoms, we consider the potential of therapy. Now, how many symptoms does someone have to have or how severe do they have to be to warrant treatment? That again is a discussion between you and your doctor. Is it bad enough? Well, what are the side effects of the medicine? What is my copay going to be? All of these are a factor. Or if I start on that medicine because of my symptoms, well, does it get better? I, and did it get enough better that it is worthwhile to be on that therapy? So, so where do we go in the future? As I have studied this and have been an active investigator with my colleagues looking at new therapies, it's not about one part or the other. It's not only about medicines. It's not only about transplant. It clearly is not only about symptoms. It's how do all of these parts fit together and how do they really get matched to you as an individual. We are in an era of individualized medicine. Now initially that term was a surrogate for saying that we were going to look at genetic mutations to decide how we treat your disease. That still is a key cornerstone. What is that genetic information? What does it tell us? From my end, it is the beginning of individualized medicine, but it is not the end. It needs to consider the individual, how the disease affects you, how it might change, the rest of your health, and most importantly, your beliefs, your opinion, uh, and your goals. I've had individuals of a certain age who have selected for very aggressive therapy because that's kind of the way they're wired and other individuals who clearly don't want to have aggressive medical therapy and, approach and uh, uh, prefer to be more conservative. So I'd say the burden is multifactorial and symptoms are common. They have clear roots in the biology of the disease. Serial assessment of symptoms is an important part of assessing where you stand with the disease, as well as whether a therapy is effective. And this final bullet will be the focus of Dr. Sherber's talk, which is that non-pharmacologic approaches we are also investigating. I'd like to thank much of the work that I do is clearly team-based, including many of the team that help us to study these things are here, the speakers here today, as well as other colleagues from a variety of disciplines uh, at Arizona State University, my continued collaborators and friends at Mayo Clinic, uh, and our colleagues at the University of California at Irvine. Thank you.